Good evening, everyone, from uh, Geneva WHO headquarters. Uh, my name is uh, Tarek, and I'm happy to be back uh, at these press conferences. It's been five months. So welcome to uh, uh, another WHO regular COVID-19 press briefing. We have a number of uh, speakers here in the room, but also uh, we will have some guests that uh, Dr. Tedros will introduce uh, in, a, in a moment. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a room with us, we have uh, WHO Director General, Dr. Tedros. We have Dr. Maria van Kerkhove, technical lead on COVID-19. We also have uh, Dr. Mike Ryan, who is our head of emergencies. We have Dr. Mariangela Shimao, who is Assistant Director General uh, on access to medicines and health products. We also have uh, Ms. Dia Satyani uh, Saminarsi, who is a Senior Advisor on Gender and Youth. Online, uh, we have uh, Mr. Stephen Solomon, Principal Legal Ad Officer. We have Dr. Sumya Swaminathan, our Chief Scientist, and we have Dr. Kate O'Brien, who is the Director for Immunization, Vaccines, and Biological. Uh, as, as we always say at the beginning of these briefings, uh, we have simultaneous interpretation in six channel languages, plus Portuguese, plus Hindi, and I would like to thank interpreters who are here uh, with us today. With that, uh, I'll give the floor uh, to Dr. Tedros for his opening remarks and uh, uh, also who will introduce our guest today. Thank you, Tariq, and uh, welcome back. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. This week, I was pleased to see that the United Kingdom's Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency gave an emergency authorization for the Pfizer, Pfizer BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine for rollout. Just like with the UK's finding on dexamethasone in the summer, this is an important scientific step for the world as vaccines will be critical in the battle against COVID-19. Progress on vaccines gives us all a lift and we can now start to see the light at the end of the tunnel. However, WHO is concerned that there is a growing perception that the pandemic is over. The truth is that at present, many places are witnessing very high transmission of the virus, which is putting enormous pressure on hospitals, intensive care units, and health workers. Some countries in Europe have managed to reduce transmission of the virus by putting stringent measures in place that limit people from mingling. As previously seen, as these measures are lifted, it's important that people should continue to follow national and local measures to ensure that cases do not rebound. Even as vaccines are rolled out, people will need to keep adhering to public health measures so that everyone is protected. We know it has been a hard year and people are tired. But in hospitals that are running at or over capacity, it's the hardest it can possibly be. My personal ask to people is simple. Please be careful. Think of health workers and act for the greater good because it will save lives and livelihoods. Fighting this pandemic is everybody's business. The government and every citizen. The pandemic still has a long way to run. And decisions made by leaders and citizens in the coming days will determine both the course of the virus in the short term and when this pandemic will ultimately end. With vaccines now being introduced, it's really important that they are distributed equitably around the world. Since Gavi, CEPI, and WHO set up the COVAX facility in April of this year, 189 countries and economies have backed it. WHO is engaged with our partners at all levels, working to boost manufacturing and ensure rollout of COVID-19 vaccines. A new 
100-100 initiative, a major sprint by WHO, UNICEF, World Bank, Global Fund, and Gavi aims to help 100 countries conduct rapid readiness assessments and country-specific plans within 100 days for vaccines and other COVID-19 tools. First, we're asking all countries to do a country readiness assessment that takes into account cold chain, health worker capacity, micro planning, initial target populations and training. This will form the basis of national deployment and vaccination plans, which will outline how to roll out the COVID-19 vaccines and identify any potential bottlenecks that will need to be planned for. For decision makers, this means passing any legislation and policies needed to expedite the process, ensuring the regulatory process is fit for purpose and confirming that the financing is in place. The COVAX facility, which is the vaccine arm of the ACT Accelerator, intends to provide doses to enable the 189 countries and economies to vaccinate those at highest risk of the virus. In the first phase of the rollout, sufficient doses will be provided to cover health and social care workers. As supply increases, vaccines will be rolled out to cover 20% of the population of participating countries and economies, which will ensure further high-risk groups are covered. The payoff from this will be huge. New research by the Eurasia Group found that the economic benefits of a global equitable vaccine solution alone for just 10 high-income countries would be at least $153 billion in 2021, rising to $466 billion by 2025. COVAX has already secured 700 million doses of three vaccines, and next year we aim to use additional funds to ensure that at least 2 billion doses of safe and effective vaccines are available around the world. To ensure that this effort becomes a reality, the ACT Accelerator urgently requires a cash injection of 4.3 billion US dollars to fast-track critical areas of work and ensure that rapid tests, treatments, and new vaccines are distributed equitably. On equitable distribution is the right choice and the smart choice. As well as ensuring supply, manufacturing, logistics, and funds are all in place, it's important to ensure that leaders communicate with their populations about the importance of vaccination and how and where to get it. The WHO Technical Advisory Group on Behavioral Insights and Sciences for Health, which was recently established and chaired by Professor Cass Sunstein, released a report this week focused on how best to ensure high coverage of new COVID-19 vaccines. The report provides initial lessons and recommendations. However, like with everything in this pandemic, we need to learn fast and be ready to quickly adapt our strategies. To say more on how best to increase acceptance and uptake of COVID-19 vaccines, I'm joined by Professor Sandstein. Professor, you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Director General. And uh, the technical advisory group worked long and hard with WHO colleagues on this report. It reflects decades of research on vaccine, vaccine acceptance and take up. Uh, still, this is an unprecedented and in some ways unique challenge and there's a great deal to learn in real time. Uh, this report is the beginning, but not the last word, and there is a great need to adapt quickly to challenges, and the technical advisory group, together with WHO colleagues, will be engaged in doing exactly that. 
Uh, without disclaimer, there are three things that we know that should be helpful in providing a framework. The first is the essential importance of an enabling environment for vaccination. Uh, central questions are where are vaccination opportunities located? How long do they take? Are they time consuming? Are they expensive? Uh, what is the quality of the experience? Are people treated with respect and kindness? And is equity part of the picture? Uh, it's clear that the essential step for increasing vaccine uptake is to ensure an enabling environment for people. The second part of the picture has to do with social norms. Uh, all over the world, vaccine uptake has been promoted by favorable norms, and sometimes it's been challenged by unfavorable ones. We know a great deal about how to promote favorable norms. Health professionals are often trusted, especially if they themselves have been vaccinated. Health professionals who are part of the local community and are understood to be connected with the identity and self-understanding of uh, people in the relevant location, they can be extremely impactful. To highlight new or emerging norms in favor of getting vaccinated in this very challenging environment uh, can be a productive strategy. In addition to creating an enabling environment and promoting uh, helpful social norms, it's very important to put a spotlight on people's motivations. Uh, motivations are an outgrowth of values, they are an outgrowth of emotions, and they are an outgrowth of information. Uh, a central way to increase motivation is to increase trust through transparency and empathy and clarity and through meeting people where they are and listening very carefully to people's concerns and, um, and fears. An emphasis on the social benefits of getting vaccinated not just the benefits to people who are getting vaccinated, the life you save might be your own, but also by emphasizing the benefit to people around you and in your community. The life you save may be your father's or your closest friend's grandmother. Local contexts greatly matter, we know that. One size fits only one. It doesn't fit all, which is one reason that learning from the community and engaging carefully with relevant people, leaders, and ordinary citizens is central both to promotion of widespread vaccination and to promotion of equity. We have in today's document a provisional framework, but it's important to underline the word provisional and put it in large font. It will be essential to obtain and consider new knowledge as it emerges. Thank you. Uh, many thanks to, to uh, uh, Professor uh, Sunstein, who is, uh, just to remind, a university professor at uh, Robert Walmsley uh, University and also chair of uh, Technical Advisory Group. I give the floor back to Dr. Tedros. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. I couldn't agree more about the need to have an open dialogue with people about COVID-19 vaccines so we can ensure they're effectively rolled out. Again, thank you so much for your leadership, Professor. And um, it's a um, very important area that you're, you're, you're covering. And we hope it will support the uh, vaccine, uh, the vaccination program, which we hope we will be starting uh, soon. It's important that all groups have a voice in the future of health and the planet. In this regard, today I'm announcing the launch of a WHO Youth Council, which will provide advice on key health and development issues affecting young people. COVID-19 has affected young people a great deal, including mental health. The Youth Council will serve as a platform for, for designing and incubating new initiatives 
and for maintaining and expanding existing meaningful youth engagement initiatives of WHO. It will work with organizations dealing with a broad spectrum of health issues affecting youth today. Young people aren't just the future. They are the present, and we must hear their voice and experience to build the post-pandemic world together. I thank you. Back to you, Tariq. Uh, many thanks, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Tedros, and uh, thanks also to uh, Professor Sunstein, uh, who is the chair of Technical Advisory Group. Uh, uh, we also have online Professor Saad Omer, who is a director of uh, uh, Yale Institute for Global Health, who uh, is a member of Technical Advisory Group and who can uh, answer uh, any questions that can come on this topic alongside uh, Professor Sunstein. Uh, also from our side, we have uh, uh, Alena Altieri online who works on behavioral insights. So if we get questions on that, uh, uh, we have uh, several people who can answer. Uh, now I will open uh, the floor uh, to questions. Uh, and uh, as always, please try to be short and one question per person. Let's start with uh, Nina Larson from AFP. Nina, you have the floor. Thank you for taking my question. Um, on the issue of uh, vaccine confidence, uh, we've seen that uh, U.S. President-elect Joe Biden and uh, several former U.S. presidents have said they are willing to be vaccinated in public as soon as the vaccine receives approval. How important do you think that would be for building confidence in vaccination? And to Dr. Tedros, would you be willing to do the same? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think it's, um, uh, it's very good that they uh, already have shown their commitment. Um, you know, they can influence their influencers, and many of those who follow them can be influenced. And it's a good, good idea. Uh, so I support uh, their offer. And I would be happy to do the same, the same, the same thing. I would be happy, you know, to, to do it. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I need to also make sure that it's my turn because I don't want to take anybody's uh, vaccine. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros. Uh, I don't see anyone in the room want to add something. Maybe uh, Professor Sunstein would like to add or Professor Omar? something on this particular question? Yes, I, I appreciate the question and agree very much with Dr. Tedros's uh, answer. To have credible leaders, people who are in positions of authority and highly visible, indicating their willingness and even eagerness to get vaccinated is a positive step. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Sunstein. And now we will move to the next question. Uh, I understand we have Barzu Daragahi from Independent with us. Barzu, unmute yourself and please go ahead. Hi, so sorry about that. Um, thank you so much for doing this. I wanted to ask you, uh, if, if ask all of you all if, if you would like to answer this question. Um, and uh, Dr. Pedros uh, answered it to some extent uh, in his introductory remarks, but how do you guys see the coming six months, um, if, if in as, as vivid a, a picture as you can describe, uh, you could sort of outline what public health officials, what policymakers, what average people, frontline medical workers could, could expect, um, what are some of the, the trials, uh, challenges, potential pitfalls uh, that we will see uh, in, 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 a, in the coming narrative in the coming months? Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Varzu, for, for this question. Uh, uh, maybe uh, Mike will start, and then we will see if other colleagues yes. have something to add. Dr. Tedros, uh, as you said, Dr. Tedros outlined much of this in his speech. But um, just to, to say in terms of each country is in a very different situation. So everyone sees the crisis from where they sit. Uh, and, uh, and I think it's very <clears throat> important that we we say that the, the, the pandemic and, and, and the global epidemic has not reached what we would say is an 
in epidemiologic equilibrium. In other words, the pandemic has not settled down into a predictable pattern. Some countries have had very low incidence, have contained disease very quickly and effectively are managing the situation, but they're at risk of reintroductions. Some countries have very intense transmission and have contained one or two resurgences of that and are approaching lower rates of transmission. Some countries have had very high rates of disease and have not managed to get it under control and continue to have sustained surges of disease transmission. And, and some countries uh, have got some control on the disease in, 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 in the last number of months and are going back into higher transmission again. And we say that because it's not a one-size-fits-all solution in terms of changing that situation. What changes the situation in one country won't necessarily change it in another. The level and intensity of the response and the direction and focus of the response needs to be different depending on the epidemiologic situation in the country at any one time. Cases and deaths will continue uh, and we have to be uh, straightforward in that. But the future is not a foregone conclusion. The number of cases and the number of deaths is to a great extent in our hands. Um, we have seen uh, the number of people infected continue to grow, but we're also seeing a data emerge that protection may not be lifelong, uh, and therefore we may see reinfections begin to occur. So the question is, what are the levels of protection in society? We're very pleased with the advent of the vaccines. Uh, vaccines will be a huge addition to the existing toolkit. Maria may speak to that toolkit that we have. But uh, again, I would like to say, vaccines do not equal zero COVID. Vaccines and vaccination will add a major, major powerful tool to the toolkit that we have. But by themselves, they will not do the job. Uh, and therefore, we have to add vaccines into an existing public health strategy. We will have to continue to work on um, uh, managing our personal behavior or hygiene. Uh, and, and in many cases, uh, we need to recognize that the vaccine will not be with everyone early next year. You'll see more and more uh, authorities around the world, um, I think, are correctly following uh, WHO, the SAGE advice, the, strategic, this is this, uh, the advisory group on immunization, in prioritizing frontline workers, uh, older persons, people with underlying conditions. <clears throat> and in that, I, we believe that focusing on those groups will significantly, significantly reduce severe uh, disease and deaths. And that will take the pressure off the health system. That will take a lot of the sorrow out of this uh, pandemic. But it will not by itself end transmission. So the, the chance of transmission jumping back up again will always be there. And as we extend vaccination out to a broader range of age groups, uh, and as we drive demand for that vaccine, in other words, as people uh, want to get that vaccine, we believe that with high vaccination rates, we can then begin to significantly affect the transmission dynamics of the virus, but not until then. So there are two phases. One is controlling and reducing death and, and severe disease, and the second phase is controlling the actual transmission of the disease. Right now, what we do have uh, at our disposal are many measures that can significantly change transmission, um, uh, and that is physical distance, avoiding crowded places, hand hygiene, wearing a mask, uh, and all of the other things that we've all been speaking about. These are the measures we have at our disposal. Um, beyond that, uh, I think I'll pass to Maria, who may be able to uh, give you some more specifics. So we're at a moment, an inflection point in the pandemic, but we're not at a point where we can walk away from what we've been doing already. We ask that people sustain the effort, uh, sus uh, sustain their behaviors, uh, work in communities to drive community behavior, and we hold uh, ourselves and governments account accountable to provide the necessary support to communities to sustain those behaviors in the coming weeks and months. Maria? Thanks, Mike. Uh, I'm sure others will, will also want to add to this because it's a great question. Um, I think the next six months are going to be difficult but hopeful. And I think they're going to be difficult for a number of reasons because we need to have the patience, we need to put in the work um, to keep ourselves safe and to keep our loved ones safe. Um, I think the next six months require from all of us, um, even in countries that have dr driven down transmission, have controlled COVID transmission, we really need strict adherence and vigilance to keeping ourselves safe. 
It's putting in all of the measures, carrying out all of the measures, taking a risk-based approach, each of us, to our daily actions from when we wake up in the morning to when we go to sleep at night for ourselves and our families. Um, and I think we need, as we take that risk-based approach, our actions will depend on the virus circulation where we live. We will continue to need to make modifications to our behavior depending on how much of the virus is circulating around. In countries that have controlled COVID, there's more movement. There's more freedom in, to be able to do the, the things that were, you know, quote unquote normal. But I know we're all dealing with this new normal and developing and, and learning what our new normal is. But I think the real critical factor here is the decisions we make right now can change the course of the next six months. Um, the steps that we take now mean life or death for us and mean life or death for our families. And I think that everybody needs to, and they do, understand the importance of that. Um, this toolkit that we have, um, we have an incredibly powerful toolkit right now, which include individual level measures that all of us can take. It's the physical distancing. It's the wearing of masks. It's the safe wearing of masks, making sure that you have appropriate hand hygiene before you put the mask on, when you take the mask off, uh, making sure that you clean your hands many times per day, um, making sure that you open a window if you're in a crowded space or they're in a space that has poor ventilation. Those individual level actions are really important. Vaccination will be another incredibly important tool that we add to our toolkit as those vaccines come online. Knowledge is part of our toolkit. Knowing where the virus is, knowing where it's circulating, what's happening around where I live, where I work, and using that knowledge to make decisions that reduce your risk. You hear us talk a lot about know your risk, lower your risk. Take those actions to be able to protect yourself and to protect your loved ones because these actions are saving lives now. And as many steps as we can take, as many infections that we can prevent mean lives saved. So there is no shortcut to putting in the work over the next six months, um, but the trajectory of this in all countries depend on our actions. Um, in the countries that have brought transmission down, they need to keep it down, make sure that it, it stays low. We're seeing a number of countries that have turned a corner. Um, many countries across Europe, which are now seeing reductions in transmission, we need to keep that up. We do not want to be in the same position we were in the spring and going back and forth between lockdown or so-called lockdown and opening up and lockdown and opening up. Um, we can keep that transmission down. And as we enter into this critical holiday period right now, really consider what you do over this period and who you interact with because if you can if you can modify your contact patterns you can modify the virus's ability to spread so um, we need to put in the work i think it will be difficult we need patience but it was a hopeful uh, next six months just some brief words because this is there's so much hope around vaccines right now right and, and actually when you look at this next six months, we, we can't be lured into a false sense of security, but at the same time, we need to maintain the hope in our hearts, you know, because we, we are seeing that science is advancing quickly, more quickly than ever in our lifetime. But at the same time, we, the reality is we will have other vaccine candidates being finalizing phase three results in the first semester. Then these vaccines, if they are successful, they will, be need, they will need to be licensed or an emergency use authorization by WHO or others. And they need to be manufactured in enough quantity. You know, so uh, let us say that the next six months, it's not over yet, but we have hope with appropriate care, you know. So let's not lose our the focus, and let's keep hope with care. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, yes, Thank Mike, you, I fully agree with Mary Angela, but uh, we also have to be extremely clear at this moment with countries that currently have uh, high levels of transmission at the end of this year, or up to the end of this year are going to have to sustain very strong control measures or this disease will blow out of control in some of those environments and they will risk ongoing epidemic yo-yo situation through 2021. There needs to be an aggressive scale-up of public health surveillance and control measures in countries that are currently experiencing very high incidence uh, because you've got to get transmission down to a manageable level 
and then the vaccines will come in and make a huge difference quickly. Uh, and and it's, it, this is the, I've heard my, our, our colleague Tom Frieden talk about the one-two punch. You know, we need to take the virus out uh, through public health measures, uh, and then we need to hopefully finish this virus with the vaccine. So I couldn't agree more with my colleague Mary Angela. We have to sustain that hope. But those countries currently in the fight of their lives, you have got to stick with this. You have got to try and control this transmission, or your health systems will not be able to cope. Some countries are turning that corner and I believe will sustain those control measures. Some countries are not, and some countries are actually going back into very high transmission levels, and there is no prospect that vaccine will end that transmission in enough time. And I think this is the difficult uh, uh, dilemma that everybody faces. We're all tired, and I agree, and we need the hope. I need this hope, and thank you, Mary Angela, for the message of hope. But we also need to be realistic. We're in a a pivotal moment in some countries. Some countries' health systems, not all, not, not, not that many in fact, but there are some countries on this planet whose health systems are at a point of collapse. And right now we have got to take the heat out of this transmission in order that those health systems can cope and bring that vaccine on uh, as quickly, uh, as safely, as efficaciously. And as our previous colleague said, we've also got to drive demand and convince people and continue to to convince people that this vaccine is a safe and efficacious way out. I have seen vaccines transform the world uh, and change the course of epidemics, and I fully expect that this vac these vaccines and the ones that are to come will do that. Uh, but uh, I don't think we're in disagreement, Mary Angel. I think we're in lockstep. But uh, I am concerned personally for some countries that are really, really struggling right now, and, and we have to protect those health systems uh, in those countries, or, or there will be even more death and sorrow. Um, Dr. Kate O'Brien, uh, you wanted also to add something on this, but uh, also on a previous question. Uh, Kate? Thanks. I wanted to um, uh, address this from uh, very much uh, building on what Mike and Mary Angela have said from the vaccine perspective. Um, what is really important is that there's no country that is going to have enough supply from the very beginning to immunize everybody who um, should probably be immunized. So I think it's extremely important that people have um, patience, as Maria has said, that uh, supply will increase over the year. Uh, it, these vaccines, we, we are really at the very, very beginning of this, uh, this endeavor. And we do expect to have more vaccines that will reach authorization based on the efficacy trials that are being conducted that demonstrate whether or not the vaccine can prevent against disease. And that is the metric that uh, needs to be um, measured against. Um, and I think what is really important, we're also seeing in the media some, some uh, concerns or changes or ex changes in expectations around who will go first. Prioritization um, in every country is going to need to take place. And it's really critical that, um, that the communities and the population of each country has a clear understanding what the basis was for those choices um, and, and why there are certain groups that are going first and which groups there are and, what, and what, what the evidence is for that. If we don't have that sort of clear public conversation, um, then I think there will be concerns in some countries about uh, who goes first, why they're going first, um, and, and this is, I just can't emphasize enough the importance, and I, I think it's, uh, the, the media is such an important means for that conversation to happen. Um, the second part of that is that WHO through SAGE, the Strategic Advisory Group of Experts on Immunization, has already issued um, their recommendations on prioritization uh, more, than, more than a month ago. And so I would really direct people to those recommendations, which then are tailored within each country. Um, but we, we have already issued recommendations about the very first prioritization, the next most priority group, and, and onward through a series of priority groups according to uh, the amount of supply that is available within a given country. And then the third point I just want to make is um, uh, I also think it's really important that people are um, prepared. Um, as we have been saying, the, uh, it's a daunting task to roll out these vaccines in the pace and scale um, that they need to be rolled out in. 
And so there are expected challenges in front of us, but there will also be unexpected challenges. And, uh, and no endeavor like this is going to go without some, some, some unexpected uh, um, set of things happening. And I think um, the more that we can be clear that we will be, uh, we will be transparent, we'll be honest, we will explain what's happening. That's how I think people get confidence in, uh, in, in the, the whole process. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just, uh, I just really want to reemphasize that um, so that uh, people don't feel that vaccines are going to be some uh, sort of, you know, turn of the switch, and then we're completely over this. People need to get vaccinated, um, and, uh, and that's going to take some time um, in every country and in any country. Thank you. Thank you very much. So this question from Barzua was, uh, was one that uh, got uh, uh, lots of interest in answering. So uh, I understand that Professor Saad Omar would like to uh, briefly add something. Uh, Professor? Yeah, just to uh, sort of pivot to um, the behavioral response. So we should, I'm sure everyone recognizes that uh, the most perfect, equitable um, delivery system can get a vial to the health care provider vaccinator's hand, but not into the arm. And so, so these behavioral aspects of immunizations are a core part of um, the response to this pandemic and the response to standing up uh, an immunization program. And countries should recognize that this has to be part of their core planning. It can't be just reactive. Um, and, and just like you plan for cold chain, uh, there has to be a planning for uh, the behavioral response that goes along with vaccination. A few things to specifically to keep in mind when you are vaccinating literally billions of people, and there are natural background events that happen normally that would have happened without vaccination. So there, those events will happen. And in the current media environment, even with the safest vaccine out there, there will be rumors. So being there are behavioral science-based approaches to inoc inoculate populations against rumors. There are approaches to counter those rumors. Similarly, uh, we know that uh, some, in certain populations, there is a possibility of behavioral disinhibition. In a sense, those who are vaccinated earlier on or others who think that now there is a vaccine available may change their behavior. And, and as uh, Dr. Ryan said, uh, we are not out of the woods in terms of other measures until for, perhaps we reach really, really high level of uh, immunization. So that countries will have to be prepared for that. And the last thing I would say is, just like we demand uh, the most um, rigorous science from vaccine development, countries should also demand the best possible behavioral tools because they, it is a science and that it is serendipitous that WHO stood up this program around behavioral insights and the technical advisory group. It was my understanding is it was planned before the pandemic. But what serendipity it is that if it had to be stand up and one of the initial tasks this group uh, is undertaking is to support countries in their behavioral response. So again, um, what I would suggest is uh, use the same level of rigor uh, in um, the behavioral response and go to the science as the fountainhead of your interventions uh, rather than uh, just guesswork for the behavioral response. Uh, many thanks, uh, Professor. So uh, we will move on with questions. Hopefully we will uh, be able to be a little bit uh, faster. Uh, and take as many as we can. Uh, we have from uh, Mon Montreal, from uh, Radio Canada, uh, Chantal uh, Srivastava. Chantal, uh, please go ahead. Bonjour. Uh, I will switch to English, but I want to let you know that I work in French as a science radio reporter. I'm based in Montreal, and I would really appreciate if one of you could give me a clip in French for broadcast purposes, but I can live with an answer in English for the content, uh, obviously. So my, I would like to follow up on something that was mentioned yesterday regarding the e-certificate for vaccination. I want to just clear up something that is a bit confusing in my mind. I want to know what it is exactly and uh, maybe hear a little bit more about what's going on in Estonia now, the partnership with WHO, and also know how it, in which way it's different from the immunity passport that you did, the WHO didn't want to see coming last summer. So where do you draw the line? What's the difference? Um, what are the hurdles and so on? Thank you very much for taking my question. 
Uh, Chantal, thank you very much uh, for this. Uh, we will answer you in English uh, right now. There is a translation, but uh, we are also happy to uh, do interview with you in French on this uh, afterwards. So please, uh, if uh, translation is not enough, uh, just contact me. I will send you an email. I have your email, and we will organize something for you. Thank you. Um, I think uh, Kate O'Brien may speak to this as well, but let me clarify uh, a couple of differences here in terms of uh, certification and just of vaccination. When it, there's a difference between uh, certifying vaccination within a country where people are issued with a, a proof of vaccination or a certificate of vaccination, which children all have, which is a way in which people uh, have a record of their vaccination, so recording vaccination. Uh, that is very different than the requirement for vaccination that may occur if someone is traveling internationally. So we have to have a very um, important debate about the issue of certification of vaccination and then the nature of, a, of discussion around mandatory vaccination. It is difficult to talk about mandatory vaccination <clears throat> when nobody has been vaccinated yet and when only small numbers of people will be vaccinated in the coming months. But we must prepare for that. There is only one vaccine that is required uh, in certain circumstances for international travel, and that is yellow fever vaccination, which is required under the IHR for travel from yellow fever endemic areas to, to other countries. Um, and therefore, uh, if uh, WHO uh, were to uh, engage in a process of uh, requiring vaccination, that would have to be supported by the international health regulations and our member states, uh, and that will require uh, further debate. Uh, with regard to Estonia and others, the government of Estonia are working very closely with the Director General, with Bernardo Mariano and our digital health initiative uh, on uh, digital tools in general. <clears throat> and one of those digital tools uh, may be a, a mechanism, and this is the tool you may use for certification or uh, <clears throat> recording vaccination, and that is an ability to move from a paper-based record to an electronic record, and that has its own challenges technologically uh, and could be a very interesting and should be a very interesting tool in both certifying vaccination and if states or member states were to require mandatory vaccination could potentially be used as a way of of uh, demonstrating or proving vaccination. There are many steps along the way. We'll be briefing our member states in the coming weeks around the process of requirements for vaccination, and Kate may speak to the, uh, the issues around vaccination certification in countries and maybe some of the work on the, the digital tool itself. Bernardo <clears throat> is not here with us today, uh, but uh, he may join us at a future meeting to describe the work with Estonia. Yeah, let me just add a little bit to what Mike has to say about this. Uh, we're, there is a big distinction, as Mike uh, described, between a tool, an electronic tool that would document that you had been vaccinated with some validation that that was a true vaccination, that it was with a certain vaccine, um, and then what do you do with that information? Um, and, and Mike spoke very clearly about um, uh, you know, not not being at a point of deciding anybody deciding that there would be any requirement of vaccination for any purpose. But I, the point I wanted to make on this was that um, although there have been so many, you know, very difficult um, and tragic things about the pandemic, um, there are some elements of our response to the pandemic that could really, um, you know, drive us forward in terms of uh, especially on the vaccination side and leapfrogging some of the challenges that have been in vaccination programs for a long time. And if, if, this, is the, if this is the moment to uh, make some real advances on things like electronic documentation of vaccination status, that could have an impact in vaccination programs that would be very, very widespread. And if we could get past the use of paper-based records, um, this would have enormous impact on uh, improving vaccine coverage, not only for COVID vaccines, um, but also for all of the vaccines that we already have that are life-saving vaccines that people around the world are still not um, receiving um, in the numbers and in the places and in the, uh, the diversity of the vaccines that they need to get. So this idea and, and making it a reality of electronic vaccination certificates at the individual level um, is an extremely interesting and important um, step forward. And we're working um, within WHO uh, across all different groups to develop the, the guidance and the standards that any, um, any 
application would should meet in order to to uh, have the elements within it that uh, that it would stand up to scrutiny. Thank you. So to the last part of the question related to the immunity passports and what is different from there. So separate to the e-certificate for vaccination that Mike and Kate just spoke about, um, in the springtime, WHO issued uh, recommendations against using an immunity passport, which is what some countries were discussing um, about issuing um, some kind of um, passport for travel for people who have been infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the virus that causes COVID-19. Um, and so we recommend against that because of the testing, the antibody testing. So this is different to vaccination. Um, this is from natural infection and then antibody tests are provided and we understand, you know, we can get an estimate of how many people had been exposed to the virus. Um, and there are still some challenges with the antibody tests that are available. Um, what we understand is, you know, 90 to 100 percent of people who are infected with the virus do develop an antibody response. Um, whether you have mild infection or asymptomatic infection all the way to severe infection. Um, and we are still learning how long that antibody response uh, lasts, how strong it is, how it relates to immunity from another infection, and how long that lasts. There's really great research that is ongoing um, that is indicating that the immune response, the antibody response, lasts for six months, possibly longer. Um, in some people, it may wane after a few months, um, but we do get a good indication that the, the natural infection immune response um, is lasting for some months. Um, we're still uh, we're about a year into this pandemic, um, and so we still have a lot to learn, but there are good results from that. So I just wanted to come in on the, the difference between the immunity passport, which is different than what you were talking about for the e-certificate for vaccination. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, Chantal, uh, we can stay in touch for uh, French uh, if the translation was, uh, was not uh, uh, enough. Uh, we go to Kai Kupferschmidt from Science. Kai, please. Uh, hey, question. Sorry. Um, nice, nice to hear you again. Thanks for taking the question. So I wanted to ask for an update a little bit on um, what you expect with COVAX. I mean, the UK, the US, probably other countries in Europe are going to start vaccinating maybe before the end of the year. And I think this already creates the perception, of course, that vaccines aren't being distributed equitably. So I'm curious, um, you know, at what point we will be able to actually see the first vaccines go to other countries and also whether you have a message for these countries that at the moment are using bilateral deals to, to vaccinate their own populations first. If I can, Tarek. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kai, for this question. So, uh, uh, Sumia, please uh, uh, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Kai. That's a really important question and that concerns all of us at the WHO. And, uh, you know, as uh, Dr. Tedros has said many times, the ACT Accelerator was created in April, led by the WHO with many other partners for two reasons. The first one was to try and accelerate the development of tools, therapeutics, vaccines, and diagnostics. But equally importantly, to ensure equitable access, because there's no point having products that do not reach the majority of the world's population. And we've seen that happen in the past with, um, with simple diseases like hepatitis B, where it took 30 years for a vaccine in, after introduction in high-income countries to get introduced into low- and middle-income countries. Um, so that's why the ACT Accelerator was launched, and that's why the COVAX facility was created. And as you know, 189 uh, countries and economies are a part of this. That represents over 90% of the world's population. So this is really, I think, uh, buy-in from, from most of the world. How are we going to do this? It's by pooling the risk in investing in more vaccines on the development side, and that's what CEPI leads on, on the R&D, and it's by pooling procurement, by, by having enough volumes so that you could uh, get good prices, but also being able to negotiate with a number of different uh, manufacturers and, and, and developers. And that's exactly what the COVAX facility is doing. As of now, we, we have uh, deals which would provide access to about 700 million doses. That's not sufficient. Uh, the goal is to get at least 2 billion uh, doses by the end of 2021, which will be enough to vaccinate approximately 
20% of the uh, population of the countries who are part of COVAX. And as was said earlier by uh, DG and, and by Mike, that's just enough to bring to an end the acute phase of the pandemic, reducing mortality, reducing impact on health systems. Now, this is going to need a, a couple of things for it to happen. Uh, the first is, of course, enough financing within the facility. And again, the DG has repeatedly called upon the world to make sure that there is enough financing because vaccine rollout in an equitable way is our route to getting the world back uh, to some degree of normality. So we, we've raised about $2 billion, uh, which is enough for 2020, but we urgently need another $5 billion in order to meet that goal uh, of 2 billion vaccine doses. So that's, that's the most important thing. The other is, of course, again, for, for political commitment and, and political leaders around the world to demonstrate by action their commitment to, to equity. In other words, sharing available doses of vaccines uh, fairly around the world. Um, and we've seen many countries actually uh, reach out to the COVAX facility expressing a desire to do exactly that. So as they, as they receive doses, they would like to share a proportion with, with the COVAX facility from day one. What we're telling countries now is that obviously as we do our best to make these deals and go forward, as you know, we have only a couple of vaccines today that are even close to getting an emergency use of, uh, authorization um, uh, and, and WHO emergency use licensing as well. So we have limited choice now, but as time goes on, we are going to see many more vaccines, hopefully complete phase three trials, hopefully proving uh, efficacy and safety. And therefore the choice will, will get bigger. The number of doses available will get bigger. Our goal is, or, or our hope is that at, by in the first quarter of 2021, that we would have about half a billion doses available to be distributed across the countries uh, in a fair manner. And this is why we developed an allocation framework uh, in order to do this uh, fairly to, to all countries. Um, and then in the second half of 2021, the, the volume of doses will pick up and the speed at which uh, they become available. So countries can start expecting doses towards the end of the first quarter of 2021. A few countries may start earlier. It's, it's likely possible that we may have some learnings by you know going early into a few countries. Um, but then uh, the majority, the bulk of the the uh, tranches would probably start moving out in the in the second quarter of uh, 2021. Thank you. Uh, many thanks, uh, Dr. Swaminathan. Uh, let's try to take two more questions, and we will start with uh, Randy Moliento. I think Randy is now freelance and used to work with South China Morning Post. Randy. Hi, thank you for taking my question. So I'm Randy Mulento now with aljazeera.com. Um, so I'm basically working on a story about Timor Leste's success in somewhat suppressing the virus with just 31 cases and zero deaths, which could be an anomaly in Asia and the wider region. So uh, my question is, what does the WHO make of this news and any underreporting concerns perhaps from the body on this? Thank you so much. Thanks for the question. So, I mean, I think what you're pointing out is um, there are some countries that have had quite some success in preventing outbreaks from really happening. Um, and a lot of this comes down to, I don't know the specifics of, of Timor Leste, I have to say. So, so we ha we'll have to get back to you on, on specifics about, um, about that. But what I can say is countries um, that have had success in preventing um, the seeding of outbreaks and, and those initial cases from turning from sporadic cases to clusters of cases and clusters of cases to community transmission um, have used a combination of factors that you hear us talk a lot about. Um, and a lot of it is an, an initial reaction and fast action related to active case finding, you know, really being aggressive and having a robust approach for um, testing cases, having a high suspicion um, of potential cases, testing those individuals, isolating those individuals, and carrying out the public health measures um, such as contact tracing, um, quarantining of contacts, making sure that they're supported in that quarantine, um, communities, talking with communities and, and making them understand and listening to the concerns of communities to understand how they can be best supported through 
um, these very difficult times, um, outlining all of the different measures that need to be put in place, the physical distancing, um, the good hand hygiene, the wearing of masks where appropriate, um, good respiratory etiquette of, of coughing and sneezing into your elbow, um, avoided crowded places, all of these things put in place. And what we've seen is this, this um, really early robust action um, taking an approach that's beyond health, um, that includes other aspects of societies, um, have really shown, have had some success. Um, and I think that that is something that we continue to learn from. Um, many countries, um, many island states um, have had success in, in doing this and preventing those initial cases from really seeding and taking off. Um, but they have remained vigilant. They've worked very hard. Um, there are other some restrictive measures that may have been put in place um, in certain locations. So it's a combination of factors. Um, it's not a one-size-fits-all. Um, the tools are there, but the application and the implementation of those tools um, have been tailored um, to different countries, um, to different areas, to different cultures, to different um, beliefs. And I think that that's, that's the take home here, is it's the combination of factors implemented in, in different ways that fit the, the, the countries and, and the people that live there. Yeah, and we could just, just add uh, that uh, Timor Leste is, is also dependent on control in some of the surrounding countries. So as countries around <clears throat> Timor Leste have got gained control of the disease, that's reduced the pressure. But I would also <clears throat> suggest that, uh, again, a bit like in some other Southeast Asian environments, uh, Timor Leste has been through very difficult times. Uh, it's relied very heavily on UN and NGO-based support. And as such, there's a very distributed sense of healthcare delivery and other uh, sense. There's a very high uh, sense of community resilience, uh, decentralized approach to the delivery of, of, of health care. <clears throat> and, and again, organizations like the Red Cross and the Red Crescent Society, they're very well represented there. So there are a lot of community-based approaches. And I know there was a lot of vigilance at borders. Uh, there was a lot of screening and a lot of follow-up of people entering the country. So there are a lot of different things that may have, again, I, I, I don't have the exact details on every aspect of the Timor Leste response, but there are factors that would point towards a lower incidence. And there are many uh, island uh, nations, and Timor Leste <coughs> is on a very large island, but smaller countries that have managed to keep uh, disease numbers very low, like Fiji and others. They may be protected by their island status, but they're no, nonetheless vulnerable. And I think it tells a tale. If you can keep your numbers low, uh, then keeping them low becomes easier. The higher your numbers go, the harder it is to get back to a low level. And there's an eventual point where you lose control, uh, or the virus takes control and you lose control. Those countries are always at risk. And as we go through further waves and surges of this disease, there is no guarantee that your last surge or wave is going to determine uh, the next. And we've seen countries uh, all the way through this early winter experience much larger surges of disease than they did in previous uh, surge, uh, waves. <clears throat> so everyone needs to remain vigilant, including Timor Leste. But it is very heartening that countries with very fragile infrastructure that are emerging as still continuing to mer emerge as nations, uh, still require a lot of external support, can demonstrate that they can get reasonable control upon a devastating mm -hmm. disease like COVID. Uh, but as, the, as is the case in a, in a number of situations, the availability of testing uh, may be a factor in, in some underreporting of disease in, in many situations. But in this case, uh, we believe that uh, the community-based approach is there, the support of NGOs, the UN system, and the, <clears throat> the resilience of the people of Timor-Leste has, has helped uh, to contain and keep this disease under some control. So can I... I didn't realize I was on still. We do have um, uh, Shagun, just very kind uh, member of our, our commerce department, just forwarded one of our sit reps, which highlights Timor Leste. So we can make sure that we send that to you, and it outlines uh, the different aspects of their strategy, and it outlines all of the different things that they put in place, focusing on strategic object uh, objectives such as interrupting human to human transmission and reducing secondary infections among close contacts and health workers, strengthening surveillance systems, and increasing laboratory capacities to detect 
detect COVID-19 cases, ensuring adherence to the strictest standards of IPC, infection prevention and control, and increased capacity for infection prevention and control, identify, isolate, and care for patients early, including providing optimized care for those patients, communicate critical risk and event information to all communities, encounter misinformation, and try to, as much as possible to minimize the social and economic impact through multi-sexual part partnerships. So we'll make sure that we provide that in, in the link uh, to have that sit rep for all of them. Thanks, Shagun. Thanks, Maria. Indeed, uh, when we send the audio file from this press briefing, we will include a link uh, on this, on this uh, story that has been published. Uh, now we will go to the last question for today. We are already at one hour, but let's, uh, let's take the last one. Uh, and I will already apologize to those that uh, we will not be able to take the questions from. But uh, as always, please contact us at media media at who.int with your questions and we will try to uh, help. Um, Jamie Keaton from Associated Press. Jamie. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tarek, for taking my question. Um, the, I guess this is for Micah Maria. Um, we've seen a number of health officials who are claiming the quality of their certification processes are better than others. I'm thinking particularly in Britain and the U.S., but many people that I've spoken to, and these are educated, reasonable people, say that they're not convinced about vaccine. This vaccine has been developed at a light speed compared to other vaccines. The mRNA vaccines are a new technique and they're uncertain about it. And other vac vaccines in the past have had dangerous or harmful side effects that may be turned up afterward. So what do you say to people who are distrustful of national health authorities or big pharma and worry that there may be unforeseen side effects or consequences that may turn up down the road, especially when there seems to be this race to be first in so many places and in so many ways. Um, I think uh, Sumia, Keith, and, and others uh, <clears throat> can speak to this, Mary Angela and others, but uh, uh, Jamie, I would ask that you also be careful with your rhetoric. Um, this is an important time for us to have a proper dialogue, and the way in which you formulate a question can often betray the way you intend it to be answered. And that's how misinformation and disinformation spreads. Uh, I think we need to have a very open debate on these issues. I think we need to get very good at getting good information out to people. But uh, preemptive statements around distrust, preemptive statements about previous problems and other things don't necessarily shape the argument and shape the dialogue that we actually need to have between ourselves, uh, with each other. Uh, it is, <clears throat> uh, there are differences between the safety and efficacy processes and then the regulatory process and the policy that's used then for distribution of vaccine. There are many moving parts in this. Um, and as Mary Angela said, it is a moment of hope, but it is also a moment in which we have to be monitoring, monitoring and be very careful. So Mary Angela and others will speak to that. But I, I understand the, 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 uh, your intent, uh, Jamie, is, 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 is good, but please let us all be careful with our words on this matter. This matters. This counts. People being vaccinated matters going forward. They need to get the right information. Uh, we don't want people's health to be affected by a poisonous debate around this. We want a positive, engaged, informed debate on this issue. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Swaminathan, would you like to add something? Yes, and, and, and thank you very much, Mike. I think there's huge responsibility on all of us, including journalists, on how and what we communicate. Uh, let me talk about the mRNA first, because many people I have this impression that in some way this can create some genetic changes in the body. This mRNA is of uh, coding for the spike protein of the virus. And the way it works is that it gets into the cells the, the body of our body, into the muscle cells where it's injected. And then it, the mRNA is basically a mechanism to give messages to the cells to produce a protein. That it, that's encoding it, encoded in it. So the cells start producing the spike protein, which normally they wouldn't, right? It's because it's a viral protein. And then the spike protein uh, is released and, and then stimulates the immune system to start making antibodies and the T-cell immune response. There is no way that the mRNA can get integrated with the genome of uh, the human beings. We do not have any mechanism to 
mRNA into our own DNA. So I think the first thing is this is one of the big myths out there that mRNA vaccines will alter genetic um, profile of, of people into whom they're injected. It, there is no way that that can happen. Now, having said that, the mRNA vaccines are a relatively new platform. And while there are several that are in clinical trials, there are several vaccines that are in clinical trials for other infections. So in phase one, and a couple in phase two, but it, it is true that we do not have uh, a lot of people having uh, been given the mRNA vaccine. So that way it, it's going to be a new one, but there's no reason to really believe that it, it should be uh, any less safe than any of the other platforms, uh, if at all, you know, it could be safer. And the, the preliminary results we have from the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines is that there was not a lot of uh, adverse events uh, during this period, but if, that's again, it's a short period. Now, when we talk about vaccines having been accelerated, I think again, important to explain to people how we've been able to do that. It's not by skipping or taking shortcuts in the scientific process of vaccine development. All of these vaccines have still gone through preclinical phase one, phase two, and phase three. Timelines were accelerated by overlapping phase one and two by regulatory agencies willing to be flexible, looking at submissions. So even before the phase one is complete, they're already ready if everything goes well to approve the phase two. That doesn't normally happen with vaccine or drug development. And most importantly, the manufacturing at scale, which was uh, invested, investments were made well before we, we will know if any of these vaccines are safe and effective. And because of that, you're able to produce doses in the millions uh, at the time, soon after the phase three results uh, or, or the interim results have been uh, released. And I think that's needed a, a huge amount of investment that governments have made, foundations have made, companies have made. And that's the main reason for having really compressed the timelines. The, the other reason, of course, is that science and technology have progressed. There have been a lot of investments made into these new technologies, like the mRNA, investments made by CEPI and other organizations over the last few years. Many labs around the world had those platforms ready. Even the viral vector, like the Chadox vaccine from Oxford, was a vaccine platform that had been tried in the past uh, for other infections. And so they were ready. And as soon as the genetic sequence of this new SARS-CoV-2 virus was made available, they were very quickly able to, within a matter of days, create a, a vaccine against this virus. So it's building on scientific progress over the last few years. It's accelerating uh, clinical trials by overlapping, and it's also by investing in manufacturing. And then there are other downstream things like regulatory harmonization and the willingness of regulators to provide emergency use authorization while waiting for uh, the full results of the, of the full clinical trials to be completed and, and submitted. I think our guests, Dr. Sunstein and, and, and Omar, want, might want to add to this. Thanks. Well, I greatly appreciate the question. It's a very important question, so thank you for it. Uh, it highlights the importance of transparency and clarity with respect to the science, and also the immense importance of community engagement and listening to closely to people and their concerns. Uh, we've learned from prior outbreaks and vaccinations that it's very important to be listening to people as well as to be speaking to them, that there's a lot that can be learned from uh, eliciting and uh, um, attending to the concerns there are. And when people are worried about risks and side effects, to be very transparent with them is essential. And also, if they have particular concerns about what they see as unnecessary or excessive speed, to engage as what, just, uh, what was just done, uh, the issue on the merits in a way that treats people respectfully. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Sunstein. And... Uh... Mike and Somia as well. I think this is a really important message for everyone out there uh, that we need to engage in a positive debate and follow the science. Uh, before um, we conclude, I will obviously give the floor to our Director General for his final word. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Tariq, and thank you to all who have uh, joined today. And uh, look forward to, saying, to seeing you in our upcoming uh, presser. Bon weekend.